Welcome to 2021, and we're still coexisting with COVID-19. And as you may know, that 19 stands for 2019. I'm your host, Hanson Hossein, co-founder of the University of Washington's Communication Leadership Graduate Program. This is the UW's Office of Public Lecture Special that brings you the best of the university's expertise in a time of crisis. And this is clearly a crisis that endures. Special thanks to these entities for their support. So with crisis comes uncertainty and disruption, we must be prepared to adapt to it. The surge in COVID-19 cases continues to demand a disproportionate commitment from those on the front lines in our hospitals. Dr. Vin Gupta was one of our scheduled experts for our kickoff episode this year, but has been called in to work at the UW Medical Center. We have rescheduled, no, really, are we there yet? With Dr. Gupta and Dr. Helen Chu for January 21st, two weeks from now. So tonight we'll explore art in a time of illness with Valerie Curtis Newton and Priya Frank, who are leaders in the world of theater and museums respectively. We've all had to get creative as we adapt to the dire constraints of this historic crisis. Lockdowns have forced a new kind of inspiration for artists, even as it has changed access to our creative institutions and their funding models. Meanwhile, the pandemic itself has forced us to reckon with who we are. What was already fragile, race relations, economic disparity, our social contract truly broke. Our fears and fury were communicated through art and even more surprising forms of expression. So let's check in with two leading cultural creators and curators on how this will all be ultimately reflected and the future of our artistic institutions as we slowly and carefully emerge from the pandemic. Valerie Curtis Newton is an award-winning theater director and head of directing and playwriting at the University of Washington School of Drama. She also oversees the Hansberry Project, which is a professional African-American theater lab. Priya Frank has been in arts leadership for over 15 years. She presently serves as a director of equity, diversity, and inclusion at the Seattle Art Museum. In this capacity, Priya focuses on organizational development, program curation, and racial equity related initiatives. Do you have questions for our experts? Email anytime during this episode to mayiask at uw.edu. Valerie and Priya, thanks for joining us in the middle of this ongoing crisis. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. Well, Valerie, I'll start with you. What has changed for you in terms of your relationship with your art during this pandemic, during this crisis? We've slammed right into sort of two intertwined crises, both the pandemic, which eliminated our ability to gather. And that that's very difficult for an art form that's predicated on shared space and time. Um, and there's also a racial reckoning going on. And so what it means in many ways is that I'm actually not able to do my work the way that I do my work because it's all moved onto digital platforms, which is useful, but it's not the same. You don't, you can't have communion in the digital space. We can, we could share some experiences, but we can't actually feel each other breathing. Um, and this idea of how we'll be able to continue to make work, I find myself doing more uh, writing and experimenting with other elements of form as a way to keep my mind occupied and allow my imagination to be at work. But I'm not making theater right now. I'm making something else, something different. And uh, I think that a lot of folks are struggling both financially and with the creative impulse because we're not able to, to do our work. So just to follow up on that then, Valerie, if as an artist, uh, given that you feel like you've been constrained by the pandemic, you've done your best to use the digital tools available to you. How much do you feel that you're bringing your full self to art? Whether Obviously, you can't have a play right now in front of people, but you're still being creative. Are you being 100% an artist still, or is something being held back from you? No, I, th I think that we are being artists still. And in some ways, uh, especially for global majority folks, we have the chance, actually, the call to be more authentic, to share more of our power and uh, and the, the strength of our stories. So in that way, I think that there's some good that's coming out of the current moment. We're not able to pretend that everything's okay. Um, 
And so that's that's making a shift. But I but I do think that there is um, a, a moment. It takes a moment to figure out how to use the tools we have to make what we can. You know, it's it's this is a lemonade moment. Right. This is a lemonade moment, and uh, and we're continuing to try to figure it out. And it, it's very difficult for an art form whose function is to bring people together, to be forced to uh, divide and retire to rooms of our own. Well said. Well, Priya, you've heard you've heard uh, Valerie talk about constraints and opportunities and and contemplation. How are your lemons, and how's your lemonade going in terms of this situation for your challenge? <laughs> <laughs> Coincidentally, wearing yellow, both of us <laughs> bringing the lemon lemonade, right? Um, yeah, I could relate to so much of of what Valerie was was mentioning, and you know, being able to like rethink what it looks like to build connection and to build access within a museum that folks actually can't even physically go to right now because it is closed, and so what what does that mean to be a connector and a convener and a space where where we use art um, to share experiences about life um, and who we are? Um, I think that we, for me personally, it's been a real moment of having to kind of rethink how I do what I do and build relationships with people. How do we as a museum, you know, be a resource for the community where primarily one of the big things what that we could offer was space. And so what does that now look like um, during this time? And so having to sort of rethink what it means to authentically do this work and build relationships and be a resource and create access and opportunity um, when the physical space is actually not there. And so, you know, that was really um, difficult at, for me at first, um, being somebody that just like loves sort of that personal connection and being able to be face to face or show up at the event and cheer pe people on or artists on. Um, so being able to kind of think through and really get creative around what that could actually look like now. Um, I think it's so interesting because it's almost forced people to get creative in ways they maybe never would have before. Um, I know that that was sort of the case for me. Um, I would say that through the pandemic, it's really given me space to kind of work on my own art practice and how the arts inform the way that I do my work and how I do community engagement work and equity work and what that actually looks like. So it's given me space to kind of have agency to be creative in ways that I think I had you know, really been before necessarily um, and forced me to kind of think, you know, outside the box when it comes to that. So it's actually been, I think, really beneficial for me. And I'm seeing also how folks in all different sectors are getting creative with what that looks like to build that connection. So not just within the arts, but outside of that as well. And so it, it seems like it and I hope it's becoming a role, you know, more relevant part of people's lives, not just as an add on, but as something that's a core value and a core element of what, you know, it means to be successful and what it is to to make connections and that art is a way of of being and living and not just um, an add on. Well, I want, I, I want to dig a little deeper into that with both of you, because in terms mm -hmm. of thinking differently about creative and allowing ourselves to be creative in a different way, even with regards to the medium that we're using right now, right? I, I'm, I'm doing this from my house using a lot of consumer grade technology. You guys are using different cameras and we're not in a professional studio throwing millions of dollars of capital equipment at this. And there seems to be a great letting go in terms of the rules of engagement when it comes to art and production and media because we've just been forced into this situation. So I'm just curious, I'll start with you, Valerie, how much of, um, are we letting ourselves go in a good way actually, because we are, you know, reimagining how we can do things differently because we just haven't been able to do what we usually do. I, I do think that there, that we're finding, that Priya's right, we're finding some places where this moment is forcing us to do some new things. And those new things are very effective for what they are. But, you know, we already have television and film. You don't need theater to be that. You need it to be something else, right? So so the part that we have been able to hold on to is the live part, 
is the the community and communion part you know if if we're you and i are watching something and it captivates us and the hair on our arms goes up at the same time that's something that theater can do in a way that film and television can't quite you know we it, the studies have shown that when we we are together in a room we start to breathe together and that kind of um not retreating to our own individual experiences, but being in shared time and space is the unique thing about what theater is. And so, yes, I can, I can make things on a digital platform. I can make f short films. I can do, uh, do that kind of work, but it's still not theater. And uh, at, uh, the place where it has been a great benefit is in the area of developing new work um, I'm able to cast literally anybody anywhere in the country. And uh, and then we just have to navigate time zones. When, when we're working on a new play in Seattle without the digital platform, we're working together in real time and real space. And I'm only working with Seattle artists because that's who's here. Um, but I've done four or five projects right this since March where the actors have been all over the country and it's possible to do it with actors all over the world. In UW, we have uh, remote learning in the drama school and some of our students are living in foreign countries. So, 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 so we're gathering people from all over the world. And that's a great thing about this moment. What's bad is that we're not sharing time and space. And And I will just take that a step further, which is, we are so segregated in various aspects of our lives. We, we, there's a Fox News group and a CNN group. There's the, the, we don't even share the same facts about events like yesterday, for example. So, and I can get whatever the content is I want through my device, curated by me, so that I'm the center of my universe. My point of view is the center of the universe. And that's what leads us into things like yesterday, that there, we, we don't actually, we're losing our ability to have empathy and to see things from another person's point of view because our lives are becoming so curated by our likes, by what we like, mm -hmm. by how many times we check that like box or the retweet. retweet. So uh, those that's a place where life um, live arts can help to share and open up something that the the um, the digital arts allow us too much self indulgent curation, in my opinion. Well, Priya, I'm going to like to continue with that thread with you. Um, obviously, people will be watching this even after today, so I just want to provide further context in terms of we're talking about yesterday. Yesterday was the what, the 6th of January, 2021, where Congress was overrun by a mob at the uh, behest of the President of the United States. And uh, how we're gonna digest this historically is we'll see. Uh, how we'll be digesting it artistically is also gonna be very interesting to see what we contemplate as a democracy. But from your point of view, Priya, I mean, for a brief shining moment, the Seattle Art Museum did reopen in the fall and had to shut down again. In terms of thinking about the challenge that Valerie is addressing in terms of that fragmentation, that inability to have empathy, how can the museum either now or once we're through this pandemic be that space, that, either that physical space or that virtual space for some of these things to be addressed in a holistic way? Yeah. Gosh, I mean, I think art itself can be a, a big convener and the interpretation of that. I think, you know, primarily the area that I have been working in in the last five years or so is around like public engagement, community partnership events, and just different ways of bringing um, folks together to really think about and talk about some of the themes around art, right? And, and the various exhibitions that we've had. And so what does that look like now? You know, where the museum's closed and folks aren't actually able to go in and see the exhibitions. And so now what does that actually mean? Um, and I think for me, it's it's thinking about too though, like the way we've shifted sort of our programming and the fact that like 
our Zoom talks, you know, our artist talks that we have, or, you know, even just behind the scenes stuff that we've been able to film with like our conservation folks or with planners, you know, for the Asian Art Museum and uh, some of the builders and things like that. It's like really kind of diving more in depth into particular areas that maybe we wouldn't have before. And so people are sort of getting a different side of what it means to even be part of a museum or work in the museum or, you know, um, have art in the museum and what it takes to actually show that work, you know, and not just the spe special exhibitions that often get the most attention, but within our permanent collection. What's been the most innovative approach you've seen either in your museum or in other museum in this country mm -hmm. or elsewhere to be able to get around the constraints of the pandemic? Something that I really loved that we did um, during uh, when, you know, COVID first began and we were on lockdown, um, I think a couple months in, we did. So we do these um, My Favorite Things tours, typically. I've given and one. So these are, <laughs> yes, exactly. And so these are tours with amazing community leaders and they choose, say, three pieces in there in the museum and they get to talk about it and what resonated for them, why they love it or why they hate it or just, you know, kind of what what they connect to on that well so what we did was we actually had um staff members that gave tours of pieces inside their homes and so it gave folks a sense of like and we posted them on like um our insta story and it was just super cool to see like my coworkers that i might work with every single day but had no idea you know about like certain things about them or in their homes um, and i just that to me was just really connective in a way that i hadn't experienced That's before wonderful. so getting to talk about and do one myself you know to talk about the my favorite painting in my house and what that meant to me and like to to kind of bring my own perspective on like how i come to this world of museums and what you know my own home space and cultivating that home space through art looks like in order to be able to be that you know person That's and so that to me i really loved um and we're going to be doing that again for we typically do our art and social justice tours around mlk week so we're going to do a similar model over the next few months um, with staff members talking about certain objects in their homes and and those connections to social justice that's work. great that's great that's amazing yeah. and thank you for sharing that so valerie you 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 you've heard how priya and the seattle art museum have done some interesting innovations you've mentioned how you've adapted so far in terms of doing some of your work using digital tools i'm curious you, you, you in in talking about this intertwined sort of dual history thing, which is both racial reckoning as well as the pandemic. And frankly, now it's the third thing, which is, you know, power and polarization in this country. Right. If right. You, how can you even think about once you're untethered again to be able to create and direct and to write the way you want to? Have you even contemplated what how you'd like to reflect this in a play or in some work of art? Or is it too soon? No, I think that it's that it's a continuation of the drive to um, allow there to be multiple uh, communities at the center of the storytelling. It's all about storytelling, right? It's more stories. There are more stories and allowing the, the different cultures to be at the center of that storytelling is what I hope comes after COVID um, as part of this reckoning so that you know, it's not all um, Eurocentric storytelling. Yeah. But folks of the global majority have the opportunity to be front and center. And my hope is that uh, post pandemic, there will be more equitable distribution of resources to organizations and artists telling different cultural stories. Um, my other hope at post pandemic is that we can figure out what the balance is between dig the digital platform and live performance so that it's not a huge pendulum swinging back and forth, but we actually figure out how to integrate both things. I, I participated in a, a festival, I think it's still up with Roundhouse Theater out of Baltimore, Maryland. It's the work of uh, Adrienne Kennedy and they picked four of her plays and we did workshops of them and found ways to present them on the digital platform. And each director took a different take 
on how to make that happen. For mine, because I couldn't be there, I couldn't get to Maryland because of the pandemic. I was here in Seattle in front of my computer, like right now. One of the actors was in New Jersey in her home with a technician who did all the stuff that Hanson was talking about having to do in his own space with the camera and the lights. And then there were a group of artists who went through a uh, pandemic protocol to be in shared space together. And so the three locations, we all worked together to make this production of a play called The Ohio State Murders happen. It, that, that, that would not have happened in the same way uh, without, without the digital platform. And so, and each of the directors had a different take on that. Mine was primarily like a short film. Another one was totally a live production, uh, punched in and out of in one of those video mixing programs. The third one was a mix of short video things and live production. And so post pandemic, I think we're gonna find more playing with all those tools to share hopefully a wider a range of stories um, and I think that that's the biggest thing is now this, this question of equity has become sort of central to cultural practice in pretty much every field. Um, well, how do we find a more equitable way to distribute resources and to promote visibility for various uh, art forms. That's that's a that's a really profound reflection. I appreciate you sharing that. I'm gonna. Uh, we actually received a couple of questions from our audience, and I want to come back to that thread in a second with you, Valerie, because there's something as a that uh, peripheral to what you've just said. So thank you for that, Priya. Th this is a question from the audience that, that speaks a little bit to the access and equity element that that Valerie just referred to. Uh, it says communal gatherings historically have proven challenging for members of the ADA community. Um, mm -hmm. Given that creative spaces have moved into a virtual platform, do you have any thoughts about how this uh, may have made the art world more accessible? And you've talked about access has always been an issue uh, for from a DEI point of view for museums. There's been certain broadening of access because everything's gone online, especially with museums. How are you thinking about it from a, a disability point of view, either now or moving forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate that question. Um, certainly, it's thinking about access differently now and what equity actually looks like as well of, you know, digital equity and folks having access even to what we're show, showcasing online. And is that even a possibility or languages, for example, and um, thinking about, you know, what are the, the barriers? Because the barriers look different now. And so that's something that we're definitely considering and needing to make sure that that's part of the planning of the events that we do. I mean, on the one hand, it's been incredible because like I mentioned, our artist talks and think behind the scenes kind of lectures and things like that, we have like, you know, the numbers have increased exponentially, you know, like 700 or 1000 folks signed up to, to be a part of this. Um, so the access from that perspective is it's broader to anyone who's outside Seattle or outside, you know, near the museum, right? It would have typically maybe been in our 100 or 300 person theater. And now it's open to the world. I mean, I think that's a really powerful way of us being able to connect with each other more broadly and to have more perspectives and, and views. But I think at the same time, that is a huge gap and a huge issue is around access issues and you know digital equity as well. And just trying to figure out what does that look like? Um, there's some really amazing resources um, that Elizabeth Ralston is her name and she heads up, it's a consortium around ADA access. And I have found her webinars and, and her teaching to be really incredible. I highly recommend um, you checking her out um, because she's done a lot with work around theaters and arts organizations around access and advice around how to be able to create a more inclusive experience, um, whether it's, you know, us describing, you know, what we're wearing and what our hair is like at the beginning, you know, tips like that, that would really kind of allow folks to have 
um, a more fuller experience virtually. So I'm learning a lot in that aspect. And I think, honestly, the skill set of what we, the jobs that I think all of us used to do and what we do now has shifted so much. And like now we're having to be, you know, like digital experts and all this stuff in different ways. And our skill sets are really vastly changing. So I'm really curious as to how that's going to kind of balance out in the future when those in-person events happen. I mean, I, th I think there's a lot of richness to this as well. Um, I think about, you know, literally it looks like it's just the three of us in conversation on my screen. And so I'm probably more likely to feel a little more comfortable or be willing to be a little bit more vulnerable, yeah. right? Because it feels like it's just us in the room versus in a room with you know, hundreds of people yeah. literally looking at us. I mean, it's such a, a change of experience. And, and to just, to pick, just to pick up on, on that that issue that Priya was talking about, you know, in in what I do in the performing arts, we're dealing with uh, 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 ADA concerns, both with regard to the audiences who come and also to the artists who participate. So when I'm casting, being open to a, a, an actor with disabilities uh, and figuring out how I can adjust my rehearsal practice in order to make it possible for uh, people with varying abilities to participate in the project is a, a, a part of what's going on uh, in, the, in the live arts is having to struggle to figure those things out. And are our facilities accessible to the artists in rehearsal, for example, um, are the theaters backstage, on stage, getting from one place to another? Is it actually accessible? And th so we have to do that as well as take care of the audiences. Great. Well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for reflecting on that. So uh, substantively, both of you. Another question from our audience, and I think this is you, for you specifically, Valerie. As we know, Hamilton uh, has shown up on um, Disney Channel. Um, David Burns, American Utopia on HBO. This question says, what are your thoughts on the Netflix production of August Wilson's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom in this time of separation? Clearly these streaming channels have done extremely well as we're all stuck at home and trying to find something to do. And so there may be an understanding that that might be our new cultural sort of uh, go-to. Just remember, just remember that Ma Rainey's Black Bottom is a film. Oh, I thought it started as a play. It did start as a play, but what people are looking at on Netflix is a film. It was filmed like a film on a film st st state, film soundstage. Uh, and the same thing, Hamilton was shot in a theater, but they had like a bazillion cameras. So <laughs> it's not like doing it in the rep with, a, with one camera or three cameras even. Uh, and then it can still be edited in post-production in a way that live performance can't. So that's that's part of our struggle is to figure out how live can live be with the digital platforms is it enough for us to have live people together and to have cameras shooting it uh to a di to a, a digital audience or do we need to actually have digital content being distri distributed to people through their devices those are different uh, mindsets about how the work gets to the people. Um, people, some people might have seen Ma Rainey's Black Bottom at Seattle Rep when it was a play there a few years ago. And that still was a very different experience than this particular screen adaptation. Ruben Santiago Hudson, who is a brilliant, brilliant theater artist, he wrote the screenplay, he added some things in the screenplay that are in the Netflix version that are not in the stage version of the play. Mm. So that's that's a thing. It's not the same thing that August wrote. It's a different thing, a lovely, beautiful, well-crafted, artistically excellent thing, but a different thing than the play that August that's wrote. That's really interesting. So we're seeing art and the medium itself change in real time because of this situation. Um, yeah. uh, Priya, we have an audience question for you specifically. Um, has your organization's mission and vision survived this tough time, or have you been forced to reinterpret your the organization, the Seattle Art Museum's mission due to the pandemic? Mm. So um, 
our mission is to connect art to life. And so in reflection, I think of literally the last, you know, almost year, what, what does that now look like? And I think, you know, art has been so central to what it is that is, I believe, kept us going um, and create, you know, creative sort of outlets, uh, whether it's, you know, watching Netflix, you know, watching films, uh, creating art yourself, making of, you know, bread or whatever it might be. It has become such a central piece of what has become like the signifiers of this time. And so I think the way, you know, it continues to connect art to life. Um, art, art is continuing to be sort of, I don't know, so central to what it is we're seeing how folks are expressing themselves, um, where it's showing up and how it's showing up in traditional and really non-traditional ways. And I think that for me, that has been so hopeful and has allowed me a lot of like joy to see how it's sort of becoming a central piece and like I said before, not just like an add on or something that's like, oh, nice to do, but it's like vital to who we are and how we're like living and surviving right now. Hey, Hanson, can I can I pick up Please a little do. bit on Please that question? Out. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm an individual artist, but I also run an organization called the Hansberry Project. And our mission is to celebrate, support and present the work of black theater artists. What the pan pandemic has meant for us is it added an additional component, which is trying to help our artists survive the lack of work. Yeah. Because people who had gigs, all of them were canceled. I personally lost, I'm not gonna say how much money this year, but, but four major, major directing opportunities across the country were all canceled. And so what the Hansberry Project has been doing is been trying to offer direct aid to artists to make to continue to make work, but also to help them with things like if if uh, I, I know of an artist who was struggling with with rent, if I could make a grant to that artist to help them pay their rent for a month, then Hansberry would do that. And there are lots of entities that have had to go into strictly survival mode because the people affected by the pandemic that are constituents of the organization have real uh, fundamental life struggles as a result of COVID-19. And so that's what Hansberry has been doing. And we continue to look into 2021 to do to commissioning and in encouraging people to make work and to fund that work and to help them bring it to whatever platform that's going to get it consumed by the public and help them to raise money to keep to keep living. Well, it's clear from your respective answers to this question that the disruption is real. I think for this final question that I'd like to put to you, I'd like to hopefully you feel comfortable putting on your futurist hats and say two to three years from now, the pandemic will be history. Um, the presidency that has caused this chaos of, of January 6th will be gone and something else will be in place. We'll be thinking differently, very differently about uh, inequity and, and race, as you pointed out from the outset, Valerie. Where do you think we're going to be with your respective artistic and business models? Will we be back in the theaters enjoying theater the same way we were a year ago? Will we be back in the museum enjoying museums exactly the way we were a year ago? Or will it be ultimately very, not very different, but different because it has somehow brought in this moment and this challenge and made it better? Um, Priya, do you want to give me a final reflection on that? Big question. Um... You know, my hope is that it doesn't, you know, just go go back to the quote unquote normalcy of what it was, um, because I, I think we're different, you know, and the way that we've lived our lives and, and shifted and and maybe what we value is different as well. And so I think going into an experience, although it might be something that you've done, you know, forever, for me, it feels different, you know, it feels different even just seeing people eating in a restaurant or, you know, things like that, because it's just so 
it's just such a switch. And so, you know, I hope my hope is that we we take things in a little differently. We take a little bit more time to actually breathe it in and recognize us breathing together, like Valerie said, and like what that actually feels like, not just like going through the motions of it, but to stop and take that in as to what that collectively, what it feels like collectively to be a part of something. Um, even, you know, in a museum and wandering around and seeing others doing the same and you're not having the same experience, so to say, so to speak, but it's also a way of kind of bringing that collective appreciation um, and sense of community together in that way. That's like kind of just immediately what it makes me think about. And I think for me personally, yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to go back to, you know, I, going to like three or four events a night, you know, back to back to back, not actually being able to take it in and experience that. And, and like, you know, instead of just checking the box, I want to be in it. I want to be in that moment and I want to experience it. And I want to, those that I love to be able to experience it as well. And to me, that's how I'm different. And that's the way when I go into a museum or to a theater, my hope is that I'll be able to hold on to this that I feel now and remember that when we all get to sit together and watch, you know, a production from the Hansberry Project. <laughs> Valerie, will I, thank you for that, Priya. Valerie, will I get two years from now to be sitting elbow to elbow with you watching a great new August Wilson production here in Seattle? I think, I think the, the thing, Hansen, is that I think the artists are that we're we're in our rooms honing our craft, itching to go make a thing. Mm -hmm. The the question that we're all asking is whether or not you will come to a to a room full of other people. After this idea that just being next to someone without a mask could kill you. Two years from now, will we have all as a culture recovered from the post traumatic stress? that drove us into these rooms in the first place. I don't know when people are gonna feel comfortable sitting elbow to elbow in a, in a room with each other. Um, are we gonna wanna check each other's uh, uh, vaccination records to make sure we've all got the vaccine? Or are we gonna be okay with getting our temperatures taken as we enter the doors? Is that gonna be like what the standard protocol is? We don't, we have no idea yet post pandemic what normal's going to look like. I just know that there are artists that are taking in the experience and translating it through their various mediums. And we're waiting for people. We will be, we will be waiting when the, when the doors open and we're allowed to step into the light together. We have some things to show you and we're looking forward to that opportunity. And if we have to show you through the digital medium for another couple of years. We'll figure that out too. It's not our preference, but we'll figure that out. And uh, for me personally, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that I will continue to take this moment of reflection to think about why I make what I make and uh, to take on a little more um, of a generative hat of deciding what I'm going to make and, uh, and then doing that from a deep place of authenticity and mission, personal mission. Oh. I, I, don't, I don't really have time to fool around with things that aren't meaningful to me anymore. And so I, I'll, I'm gonna try to hopefully take that sense of meaning and purpose into whatever comes next. That's a powerful, eloquent way to conclude this conversation. I, I saw Priya nodding uh, heartily along with you, as I think it's a, I suspect that there's collective agreement on what you just said. So Valerie Curtis Newton, Priya Frank, thank you so much for your insights and your profound reflection upon this time. I'm absolutely grateful to you. And join us again next Thursday, January 14th for Coexisting with COVID-19. Are the kids going to be all right? We'll focus on how our children's lives are being affected as they endure this global pandemic, what unique childhood experiences are they having, how is it impacting their lives, as well as the parents, teachers, and adults that take care of them. You can register for the event free of charge at uw.edu slash lectures. Feel free to start the conversation with us now by asking one of our guest panelists about their thoughts on if the kids are gonna be all right. 
you can email your questions to mayiask at uw.edu. I hope you're all coexisting with COVID-19 to the best of your abilities and resources. I'm Hanson Hossein. Be well and be safe.